Greetings and welcome everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I am the Executive Director of the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's book reading and discussion with Ellen Waterston. We want to thank the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation and Jordan Schnitzer for their extraordinary signature sponsorship of the Sitka Center's 50th anniversary this year. We also want to thank our sponsors McMinimins, Framing Resources, Brian Potter Design, Siltstone Wines, McLean's Printmaking Supplies, Mills Ace Hardware, Green Guard Farms, Schwabi, Williamson and Wyatt, Tom and Ellen Abrego, and Judy Vogland and Bob Dayton. Thank you to all of our sponsors. We'll do a, a reading and some discussion and Q&A uh, with Ellen. If you have a question for Ellen, you can go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A tab and then we'll do our best to get to as many of those as possible. And, um, and then we're gonna complete the program today at about uh, somewhere between five and five to 15. So count on us to, to finish promptly. High Desert writer Ellen Watterson was a Sitka writer in residence in the spring of 2010, and we are thrilled to have her back with us today. Watterson has published three prose titles, intruding Where the Crooked River Rises, a collection of essays, and her memoir entitled, Then There Was No Mountain. Watterson was also, has also published four books of poetry and won numerous poetry awards, including the Will Award and the Obsidian Prize. As a literary arts advocate, Watterson is the founder of The Writing Ranch, which offers workshops and retreats for writers, and the Watterson Desert Writing Prize, annually recognizing a nonfiction book proposal that examines the role of deserts in the human narrative. She's previously founded and for over a decade served as director for The Nature of Words, a literary arts nonprofit featuring an annual literary festival in Bend, Oregon, where she lives. Today, Watterson will read from her most recent title, Walking the High Desert, Encounters with Rural America Along the Oregon Desert Trail. If you've got a question, use that Q&A tab. Ellen, why don't you go ahead and unmute your mic? It's my pleasure to introduce Ellen Watterson. There we go. There's some mysterious power out there that's restricting my activity, which is lucky for everybody. So thank you. Thank you very much, Allison, and thanks to Nicola and Nancy and Tamara and and to the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology for helping spread the word about this book, Walking the High Desert. And not to mention my thanks for past residencies I enjoyed at the beautiful Sitka Center campus. The fundamental importance of the opportunity to creatively pause, prune, and ponder that Sitka provides artists and scientists cannot be overstated and deserves and requires all of our support. I'm indebted also to the many trail angels who supported me throughout this literal and metaphorical walk, as well as in this book writing and making process. A special thanks to the photographers you saw listed earlier, whose high desert images were displayed as we gathered, and I'm sorry about the confusion about the silence. However, the, the, the high desert is a great big silent place, so maybe that was appropriate. And most significantly, I want to thank the University of Washington Press for publishing this book. So, good afternoon. Originally, Walking the High Desert was going to focus exclusively on the new 750-mile high desert through hike created in 2012 by the Oregon Natural Desert Association, ONDA, that starts at the Oregon Badlands Wilderness outside of Bend and ends in the Owyhee Canyonlands in the far southeastern corner of the state. As a former rancher and now a townie, my goal was to look at the public-private land uses as circumscribed by the Oregon Desert Trail, or ODT. And as a former New Englander and now desert rat, too, as I do in much of my poetry and prose, pay tribute to the desert I so love. But life and the 2016 Bundy occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Headquarters 
is what happens when making other book plans. That event thrusts the high desert onto the national stage, exposing social, economic, and environmental issues the high desert is confronting, and that it turns out our challenge is shared nationally and in some cases internationally. I felt compelled to enlarge the scope of the book at that point. Using ODT, the Oregon Desert Trail, as connective tissue, chapter by chapter, I address seemingly intractable problems each section of the trail represented, cautionary tales relevant to us all wherever we live. So you can already tell, walking the high desert is not a travel guide per se, rather a travel companion. It is a blend of travel log, memoir, meditation, history, current events, philosophy, science, and commonplace book. It was completed BC, before COVID, yes. And BLM in this text stands not for Black Lives Matter, but for Bureau of Land Management, which along with the US Forest Service manages federal lands throughout the West and in central and eastern Oregon, the BLM oversees one quarter of the entire state, 255,000 acres to be exact. But it turns out walking the high desert is uncannily relevant as it addresses racism, pestilence, be it avian, insect, or animal born. It addresses natural resource management, climate change, protection of indigenous and minority cultures and communities, and land use issues. This afternoon, I struggled with what to read. I was gonna read maybe an excerpt about the dark sky movement, because as you saw in some of the slides, the Oregon Desert Trail moves under some of the darkest night skies in the world. I was going to read about what was for millennia the territory of the nomadic northern Paiutes, or about the incursion of cattle and sheep interests, maybe a section about the hapless homesteader settlements gone now without a trace, and the pie crust promises developers make even today, locating housing developments in desert environments, or, or grazing rights, natural resource management, wild horses urban rural divide, but all of you would have had to have brought a reclining chair and sleeping bag if I undertook all of those readings. So I have settled on a shorter series of readings that I hope provide a whiff of high desert air and a sense of the book's scope. First of all, it's Oregon, not Oregon. And it's Malheur out here, not the French pronunciation Malheur, although the French trappers who came through Oregon's high desert in 1819 were plenty unhappy. Once they left the stands of Ponderosa in the mountains and entered the desert, nothing went right. Their cached beaver pelts were snatched by Indians. There was little water, no shelter, no shade. It didn't go much better for the Hawaiian trappers working for the Northwest Company, who came up missing the same year in the farthest southeastern corner of the Oregon Territory, and after whom the stunningly beautiful Owyhee River and Canyonlands were named, that being the standard spelling of Hawaii at the time. Speaking of names, the Oregon Outback the sage step, the empty quarter, the cold desert, the back of beyond, cowboy country, the nothing but nothing, the sagebrush ocean, the great basin, the great sandy desert, the rolling sage plain, the Artemisia desert, all refer to the same thing, the high desert. Since the 19th century, us settlers have tried to name this place and thereby, as is the fancy of settlers, to lay claim to it. But the enduring fascination of the high desert and the reason its survival as a wild place is within reach may well lie in the fact that this vast open can't quite be named. It stays always one step ahead of the namers, luring us who would try deeper and deeper into its embrace. 
the high desert is known for its playas or dry alkaline inland lakes. They are the result of evaporation seasonally exceeding recharge. And after you have moved through the badlands, up and over Pine Mountain, out across the vast sagebrush ocean, through Christmas Valley, past Fort Rock, the first playa that you come to is Summer Lake, once part of an enormous paleo lake or inland sea. And I read, at this point on the trail, you're likely to begin channeling your inner mystic. It's not heat stroke, it's not delirium, it's the effect of this magical section of the Oregon Desert Trail. How much have you, how much have I confused the coyote by peeing on his territory, you might find yourself asking, or who am I? Tat tuam, thou art that in Sanskrit. Welcome to the unreality of reality, the world of ellipses. Beware of odd impulses, such as setting up your GoPro in the middle of the lake bed, as one ecstatic traveler did, then running and leaping and twirling, stark naked, back and forth in front of the camera, getting farther and farther away, dancing, dancing, what a life does, dancing, dancing, a definition of infinity. Mother Nature is psychedelic. Notice how increasingly you are thinking, quote, like an ion, unquote, as the reader board on the Summer Lake store encourages. Or as poet David White asks, how do you know you're on your path? Because it disappears, that's how, unquote. Looking across Summer Lake is like viewing a kinetic exhibit of Mark Rothko paintings long horizontal bands of color that change minute to minute, depending on the movement of clouds, the position of sun, the presence or absence of water in the seasonal five by 15 miles of lake. If by now you haven't been brought to your knees by the perfection of nature, reminded of your relative place in the scheme of things, this section of the trail will take care of that. Choreographed by the mercurial winds, alkaline dust devils gyrate and hula across the flat clay stage. Water bullied by breezes appears and disappears, the waterline rising and falling willy-nilly. The doleful call of the whippet, gargle of raven, bugle of sandhill crane, howl of coyote, and yes, wolf, punctuate the air. Family quarrels between the high scarps and ridges produce rain, lightning, and howling gusts of wind hurled back and forth that send black bear and cougar running for cover. The air is electric with energy. Walking under the brow of Diablo Mountain, its gentle slope shaped by wave actions, eons ago, were guests of a place in space where mountains walk and rocks inch across lake bottoms. True story. The surface of the clay-like dried playa appears brittle, but underneath, where there is moisture, it is stretching and cracking the surface. That cracking action slowly moves what sits atop its wizened gray elephant hide, like surface in one direction or another, like restless legs at night, subcutaneous crawling, yearning, an itch to move, to migrate, to shift, to explore, like all of us. There aren't many restocking outposts along the trail. And what there are, are very small. Fields, Adele or Adele, Flush, and one is Paisley, population 200. And it offers a welcome break to the through hiker or to those of us, as I do, who hike sections of the trail, returning often to our favorite ones. So I wanna share a little bit more about Paisley. 
And I think it will help you see how this trail is serving as a metaphor for things that all of us are addressing wherever we live. <clears throat> I'm an NBA fan, go figure. Those who know me would never have guessed. I attribute it to the fact that when my late husband and I first moved to our remote high desert ranch, north of Brothers, Oregon, the Blazers had recently won their 1977 NBA title. Blazer mania, the whole state seemed like a small town, one community cheering for the same thing. One shared focus, one hope, one realized victory. Over the intervening years, I've sat courtside at Blazer Games, shouted, Jerome, take me home in the 90s, chanted, the ref beats his wife with the best of them, tried to take life's hits the way Robin Lopez took the more literal kind under the basket, cheered the little, the Lillard McCollum duo, enjoyed a VIP dinner with the team. But I have to say, the single most entertaining basketball game I ever saw was at the Paisley School Gym. Paisley is a sports friendly and especially basketball friendly town. Balls are left in the paved blacktop community playground. The nets, albeit a bit frayed, the hoops a bit rusted. After a meal at the Pioneer Saloon, you can play a quick round of horse before hitting the road, a rural digestive. The town's high school gym is so small, you're inadvertently on court when you sit courtside on the wooden bleachers. As the game unfolds in sync with the stampede of players up and down the court, spectators tuck or bend their legs to stay out of the way, a kind of seated chorus line. The game I attended was Christian Academy of Bend, a fellow 1A team, that classification based on school population, with 1A being the very lowest. The score was tied double overtime. As a last ditch effort, Paisley brought in a free thrower who had not been on the court thus far into the game. A slight wiry kid from Montenegro. This was his first season of basketball. For that matter, this was his first season in America, a year at Paisley School. He was slight, small with a corona of wild black hair. He walked to the line, shrugged a couple of times, took a deep breath, to tie and keep the overtime going, he had to make one basket. To end the overtime and win the game, he had to make two. He sank them both. Everyone, including the opposing team, was dumbfounded, as was he. After a momentary stunned silence, everyone leapt to their feet, cheering the newly minted hero. The not so good news is that the Paisley School is constantly dodging the threat of closure. If its enrollment drops too low, it doesn't qualify for state support and can't pay staff. To prevent that possibility in 1995, the school board decided to create an international dormitory for high school students. The program attracts about 12 a year from all over the world, and they make up about a third of the upperclassmen. Former Paisley School District Superintendent William Wirtz put it bluntly, if we don't have kids in our dorm, we don't have a high school. That ringer from Montenegro who sealed the basketball victory for Paisley, he was one of the international students. In 2015, John Steffies and Rebecca Steele, an intrepid young couple from Portland, purchased the Pioneer Saloon.
There I am. Are you? I hope. I hope. I wish I could hear all of you. Um, I'm so sorry. Whatever that was. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, we're in Paisley, Oregon, and we've just finished the basketball game, and we're about to be served a meal by the international students at the Pioneer Saloon. Now, mind you, this is a community that is 90% white and politically red. The common denominator among all residents is hard work. Given the vagaries of cattle prices, fuel prices, the weather's effect on crops, income is middle to low, even for those who own their ranches free and clear. Paisley has Methodist, Jehovah's Witness, and Catholic churches. I think it's fair to assume people of color or with different religious beliefs don't generally fit in the worldview held by most in and around Paisley. But in addition to the friendly and persuasive effect of the presence of the international students, open-mindedness is being encouraged in other and unanticipated ways that promote a more accepting outlook, whether Paisley residents are happy about it or not. The Catholic Church has an increasingly difficult time recruiting priests to rural parishes. And in many cases, Catholic churches, including those along the ODT, are led by priests from African countries or India, the Middle East, Mexico, or Central America. In Paisley, those who might harbor an attitude about people of color are not only being served a meal by people of color, they are confessing their sins to a person of color. As Michelle Obama says in her memoir, Becoming, it's harder to hate up close. So now I'd just like to read a very short section that again extols the beauty of the desert and, and the unique things that might take place. Uh, and then I will conclude with, well, I won't be a spoiler. I have made it to the top of Steen's Mountain. I step up to the gnarled juniper lectern, grasp the old limbs, lean into the sage-scented breeze, listen to rocks tumble down, down the steep face, loosed by fleeing mountain sheep, nimble over the basalt cliffs and ledges. I plant a small flag of promise to myself as I look out over the Alvord desert below. How I love this big country. What affection I have for the people who live here. From them, I have learned hard work, honesty, how to show up, improvisation, making do, neighbors helping neighbors, community, giving, joy. I run pell-mell down Wild Horse Canyon, tumbling toward a treeless, vast, flat expanse. Another definition of eternity is expressed by the Alvor Desert. Hot springs ooze and belch. The molten center of the earth beckons. The landscape is like something out of the bizarre world Ingmar Bergman created in his films. And what is that on that flatbed? It looks like a grand piano wrapped in bubble wrap on a mattress. Your eyes do not deceive. Planet right. And you could be getting to the Alvord Desert in time for a classical piano concert. Yes, you heard me right. I'm talking Hunter Nowak, the creative genius and classical pianist who hauls his Steinway concert grand piano around on a trailer, parking it in the most remote locations in Oregon during the summer to perform free concerts. Nowak embodies the kind of out of the box thinking and imagination that forces us to look at our if you'll forgive me, petty shit for what it is, at divisions and conflicts for the wasted time they are. With his nimble fingers, Noak reads the dusty braille of the keys, unveils our suffering, soothes this rocky world, sharps and flats, repairs the frayed cords of kindness. He scales the ineffable longing we have for love, 
summoned by ghost notes and fugues. He dares us to jump backward off the edge of everything, repelling note by descending note to land where we all began as stardust, a single cell in the desert. The language of classical music is the ultimate peace pipe. He calls the series in a landscape, classical music in the wild. People emerge out of the gloaming for the concert in the Alvord. Camp chairs are set up, picnics spread out on blankets. The Steinway is unwrapped, tuned, earphones are available that remotely transmit the concert directly to your picnic chair. Or you can listen plein air, watch the notes rise, gather, and be swept away by the desert's evening breeze. So I will conclude with this final reading. Speaking of classical music, you'll see the connection shortly. And before I conclude, I want to thank you again for your patience with the connection glitch and your willingness to come and gather today to hear a little bit about the high desert and my book, Walking the High Desert. So thank you ever so much. After completing the Camino de Santiago and receiving my certificate of pilgrimage in Santiago de Compostela, I continued as the ancient pilgrims did to the town of Finisterre, nestled on bluffs overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. The early day penitents christened this town the end of the earth because they believed those bluffs to be exactly that. They would retrieve a scallop shell, the emblem of the Camino, and return to their villages with evidence they had stood on the precipice, the brink, looked out across the vast unknowable, stared down the great void. But guess what? The world is not flat. So I ask you, what false endings, what false limits of nature, what false limits of our capacity to come together and work out sound solutions do we subscribe to? What social media silos do we hole up in? What cultural dictates do we succumb to that limit our vision, undermine each of our capacities for making positive change? What blinders do we wear? When you cup your hands over these words, pages, chapters, where do you feel the most warmth. I'm betting it's the stories, the anecdotes, listening to, seeing the person across the table as an aspect of yourself. There's the rub and the answer. During the second half of life, according to author James Hollis, the focus changes from the external, what does the world ask of me as professional, partner, parent, to an inside job, what question do I answer with my life? Each of us, according to Hollis, is a crucial part of a great unfolding. Something is living us more than we are living it. We don't create ourselves, we happen to ourselves. We don't make our story, our story makes us. As W.H. Auden wrote, we are lived by powers we pretend to understand. The common denominator for a tenable future requires staying at the table until we discover our shared humanity. Don't take your life personally. Take it to the limit. To heal the effects of the Bundy occupation and the rude desecration of the refuge headquarters, Bend residents Jay Bowerman and his wife Teresa turned to music, commissioning a symphony as salve, as blessing. They enlisted Chris Thomas, a young and accomplished Los Angeles-based composer who spent hours in the refuge recording the wind and the bird call turning those sounds into orchestration. In May of 2019, I drove to Burns for the premiere. It was held in the high school gym, banners extolling the Burns Highlanders were suspended from the rafters. The school slogan of let fear be far from all was painted in large letters across the cement block wall. It was in that very gym in 2016 that rancorous meetings between area residents, law enforcement, federal government representatives, and the Bundy contingent took place. 
At the time, there was no sign of any willingness to turn swords into plowshares. The world was indeed flat. But on the afternoon of the premiere, the world was round. The gym was filled, estimated 500 in attendance, with a very different energy. The audience included old and young farmers, business owners, ranchers, local officials, Paiutes from the nearby Burns Paiute Reservation, busloads of Bendites, fathers in John Deere caps with children in tow, little girls in princess dresses, a poet from nearby Hines who leaves poems in Ziploc bags along the town's walking trail for people to take and enjoy. The Central Oregon Symphony musicians from Bend clad formally in black dresses or tuxedos tuned their instruments the cacophony like the squabbling and squawking of a flock of cranes coming in for a landing. The Harney County judge welcomed everyone. Maestro Michael Gazmi, conductor of the Central Oregon Symphony, came on stage, took the baton in hand, and raised it into the air. A live recording of the song of the red-winged blackbird opened the symphony. Soon, violin and cello began to weave their way in unobtrusively, seamlessly. The movements evoked the early formation of the Malheur Basin, offered a musical tribute to the Paiute, visited the dark recent chapters in Malheur history, celebrated the birds of the refuge and concluded with an uplifting musical fanfare, a toast to the future of the region. When it was over, everyone jumped to their feet, whistling and cheering. True art appeals to our humanity, Chris Thomas said. It has the power to heal and connect us, to move us from focusing on our differences toward what we have in common. It is now to each of us to create movement and momentum toward commonality, to perceive what it is and smartly inform what will be, to perceive what is and smartly inform what will be, and in so doing, make sure this desert, this region, this nation, this world can continue to ask the questions worth asking, to seek the answers worth seeking. For those of us who love the Oregon Outback, it is up to us to shape and ensure the future of all that the high desert embraces, critters, people, magical places. So those who follow can also rejoice in Earth's bold collision with sky, the iridescence of the raven feather, the magnificent canvas of the Great Basin. We must think like an otter, an owl, a lily, a lupin, Think like a sawyer, an eagle, a Paiute, a settler, a cowboy, a canyon. So those following can discern the faint contrails of our triumphant tragedies, of the right work we accomplished, writ across this scape. And within those chalky tracings, next generations can inscribe their own stories of what's best for most. We'll do this. Of course we will. And so will those who follow, because it's the meet and right thing to do. And just watch this straight-faced desert crack a smile of deep, deep gratitude. Thank you. So if I'm still on mic, I look forward to uh, help from the staff of Sitka in taking your questions and um, hearing what your reaction is to walking the high desert. Helen, thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. I do have a few questions here for you from our audience. Um, and I'll just go ahead and read them one at a time and you can answer. Does that sound good? Perfect. Okay. So our first question is, what is the last book that made you laugh? The last book. This reminds me of a question that came into another Zoom a reading that was kind of a stumper question like that, which was from my grandson. Um, but I trust this isn't from my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> this would be from uh, Christy Stevens. Well, the last book, well, I suppose in the Buddhist sense, 
Even the worst books make me laugh, right? Because it's all kind of a big joke and we need to get over ourselves. Uh, to, <laughs> to give you a specific title, um, I would say that uh, I have a book on my coffee table which is titled Capital C, Capital B, Capital C. And it has, it plays, it's, or it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like vanity license plates, but it stumps you. You're supposed to interpret what's going on in the image with single letters. That's the best I can do. Very fun. <laughs> Our next question, uh, what book could you not finish? Hamilton. Hamilton. Okay. What book changed your mind? Well, if you, if you get a copy of Walking the High Desert, and if you read the book, and then if you look at the bibliography in the back of the book, you will have a different kind of a map. Uh, not, the, not the map of the Oregon Desert Trail that was on the screen before I began. But it'll be a map in mind changes. Obviously, song lines, Bruce Chatwin's song lines is a mind changer. Okay. The writings of Joseph Crutch. The great, the great desert writers to me um, bring the truth of the desert forth for us. And, and that truth is available to all of us if we put our toe in the desert sand. Wonderful. The next question is, what is your comfort read? Um, well, you know, it's almost, uh, I wish I had a comfort read plan. I have what I would consider more of an unweeded garden stacking, <laughs> piling up next to my, my bed. Um, and, uh, so I can, I, I, that, you know, there it is waiting for me. I know how wonderful the journey will be in, inside each of those books. It's just a matter of getting to them. So, but I guess the comfort read is when I actually get time to do it. There you go. I, I too have an unweeded garden of books to read. Uh, Joan Bowers is wondering if you could repeat the composer and title of the commissioned work for yes. the celebration. Um, the composer's name is Chris Thomas. And the title of the symphony, I believe it's the, it, it's the Malheur Symphony. Um, I think if you, if you Google uh, Chris Thomas, Malheur Symphony, you'll get the accurate title of it. Oh, okay. But uh, yes. Wonderful. Chris Thomas and the Malheur Symphony. Barbara Schramm uh, requested we repeat the Hollis quote. Oh, yes, indeed. <clears throat> so, um, According to James Hollis, during the second half of life, the focus changes from the external. What does the world ask of me as professional partner parent? To an inside job, what question do I answer with my life? Each of us, according to Hollis, is a part of a great unfolding. Something is living us more than we are living it. We don't create ourselves, we happen to ourselves. We don't make our story, our story makes us. Very nice. And one, one thing I just would like to add, there was so much I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, what I find so interesting really is if we look at our lives according to our biographies of place, there are many ways to approach a biography, but where have we all landed? Where have we stayed? And what landscape shows up to teach us what we came to learn? 
for me, it's been the high desert, though I'm a New Englander. Um, mm. This high desert is, the, is, is my landscape. You know, and I, I have friends who go to Ireland and they never come back. So, you know, for all of us, it's a different place. But I just recommend that you consider your life through that lens. Okay. You're, you're a desert transplant, you could say. Yes. Our next question from Lori Ann is, do you wake up early and stay up late in the desert? She says, those are my favorite times out there. If yes, how did you rest during the day? <laughs> well, uh, yes, yes to getting up early. Um, I'm, I kind of go with the light, I guess. I just, I move with the sun. So in the winter, I get to sleep a little more. But right now, of course, despite the moon not cooperating, the Perseid meteor showers are on full display. And before that, we had the comet. And, um, and as, as you saw in the slides at the beginning, and as I mentioned, uh, there is a full chapter on the extraordinary night sky that, that is, is your cape as you're walking the Oregon Desert Trail. And now the Pine Mountain Observatory is making great effort to inform the communities of Bend, Redmond, Prineville that are slowly creating a light dome, right, that eventually will interfere in the ability to view some of the night sky. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, we have environmental challenges beneath our feet and above us as well. Absolutely. Ellen uh, would like to say she so enjoyed your storytelling and she is wondering who some of your favorite writers of the wild places of the American West, who ha which of those writers have influenced you she says she's reading Wendell Berry now. Bravo, or brava. <laughs> um, well, again, you know, uh, it, 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 questions about books and titles and favorites always stop me in my tracks, and it's very awkward, frankly. Um, but I think it's sort of like asking me who's my favorite child. I have three, um, and I don't have a favorite. Um, and so again, there are extraordinary nature writers, you know, coming from New England, the, the sort of classics, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and desert writers such as Crutch, Joseph Crutch, that, that kind of ilk. But again, in, this, in, this, in the back of this book, uh, it, it's your summer reading list. Um, so, you know, you can, whether you're wanting to learn about the ecological basis of revolutionary change, or again, song lines, or the very controversial book from years ago, Sacred Cows at the Public Trough, uh, or Animal Minds Beyond Cognition to Consciousness. So there's that. Then there are the, the classics, um, The Oregon Desert, E.R. Jackman's classic book, and uh, I, I just think that Robin Kimmerer, her treat, how she, how she writes in and through nature is, is extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, uh, the book Feathers is something that I just love as well. Uh, uh, yeah, on and on, really. So do I have a favorite? It's... I, this is, I'm, I'm being facetious here, but it's like porn. You know it when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll Sorry. all have to pick up a, a copy <laughs> of your book so we can have the, our new summer reading list with the, uh, the bibliography. Mar, Mar or Valles, or Valles, I'm very sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, is interested in knowing when did you do this Santiago pilgrimage and how long did it take? So um, I did it in 2013 and uh, be aware that there is, there are many pilgrimage routes. There's one that goes from Portugal to Santiago, 
There's a northern Spain route. You can start way up in Spain, or sorry, in France, and descend over the Pyrenees, and then take the more common route. So when people say, did you do it all? It's generally the one, they're generally referring to starting at the border and uh, coming over the Pyrenees and making that trek. I mm -hmm. did roughly, oh, I'd say slightly over a half of that long trek. So it took me roughly um, a full month plus of uh, walking every day. Wow, what a, what a feat. And I will say that it became a verse novel called Via Lactea, which means Milky Way. And it was turned into an opera. And it, it premiered in Bend in 2016. And there are discussions now to po possibly bring the principles together to perform the arias on Zoom just for the pay of it. Oh, that would be wonderful. Right. Mandy is wondering, uh, could you tell us about your key, your key uh, takeaway? What did you learn personally in your time in the high desert? I just, I bow to it. I bow to the desert. I, I mean, maybe, maybe all this is really about is taking the time to really and truly get to know something anything really. Hmm. Um, but uh, the key takeaway was, you know, there are people who drive Highway 20 between Burns, Oregon and Bend, and they cannot get through there fast enough. They look around at that landscape and they think there is not one thing to recommend it. But when you sort of get up close and personal with the nature of it, it is extraordinary how sagebrush curls its little teeny leaf to guard the dew and save it for the next hot day. Um, I mean, there are endless examples of the uh, uh, amazing natural world. And then the other great takeaway is that we drive through little teeny towns, we do or don't stop, we, we sort of make conclusions about their beliefs or outlooks or attitudes. And these rural communities are very diverse. And it's sort of, they're sort of one of everything. And I think it's uh, a mistake to, to it's, 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 you know, it's that thing when you point one finger, they're three pointing back at you. Um, you know, to stay open. Yeah, there might be very offensive, I love guns, if that's offensive to you, which it is to me, in shop windows in small communities. On the other hand, what's their perspective? Well, it's uh, a freezer full of meat, right? So it's, it's truly a matter of, of meeting up with people. There are, um, the, the fabric of a little community like Paisley was astounding to me. So that, that was a wonderful takeaway. Um, and the vision of the Oregon Desert Association in a way, how clever to make people more aware of something they're working so hard to protect by giving them a kind of a, an invitation to access it on foot or mountain bike or people use all kinds of things to, to make the trek. Absolutely. It can surprise you if you let it. Yes. I have a few questions here from Allison. She says, how is the pandemic changing your writing practice? Uh, I, I, you know, I have to say that I've been in a bit of the, you know, the post, the post launch of this book. It's been out um, since the middle of June. And so there's still some um, uh, activity and excitement and events and that sort of thing. So working on a next project, it's really um, at the stage of collecting notes and ideas and shaping the idea and that kind of thing. I, I would say overall, I'm very grateful for loving writing because um, and as a writer, really, the isolation of Corona 
is familiar to me. Um, so I would say that it hasn't felt all that different other than meeting like this and really missing feeling in a room with my tribe, as I'm sure I would feel with whomever you all are out there whom I can't see. <laughs> but uh, that I miss very much. And, um, but if we're smart and clever and careful and considerate, we'll meet in person soon. I like that. The four C's. Well, three C's and one S for smart. <laughs> Um, for those considering writing a memoir, what advice would you have for them? Oh, I don't know. I mean, um, what writing anything, you got to get ready for your butt in the chair a lot. Uh, writing a memoir, um, <clears throat> there's so many different types of memoir. If it's, uh, you know, uh, well, I would just have to point you to Judith Barrington's book on writing memoir, whomever, Allison, or, or whomever you're asking that question on behalf of. It's a really excellent, excellent guide. Uh, I use it when I teach. And I think it pretty well covers most of the issues and or questions um, that, that ad addressing the writing of a memoir would raise. Sure. Judith Barrington on memoirs. That'll be on our summer reading list as writing, well. Writing the memoir. It's called. Writing the memoir. And Judith Barrington, as you know, is a Portland poet and memoirist and uh, founder of, co-founder of Soapstone. I mean, she, she, she is a huge literary figure in Oregon. Oh, wonderful. Peg asks, can you tell us more about the Writing Ranch? So <clears throat> the Writing Ranch, um, I, I began in the year 2000. And the idea was to offer workshops, retreats uh, for established and emerging writers. But my main motivation was to have those take place in a landscape that it was a, was a surprise, you know, it was a new place. Um, and to, and to let the, the, the landscape sort of ambush what we thought we came to write. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're, I would invite this questioner to look at the Writing Ranch website. Um, you can learn more about where workshops have taken place and will be taking place and how people have responded, uh, to them. And, um, it's, I, I, don't know if it's sabotaging my own writing or if it's a healthy love of uh, encouraging writing and, and, and supporting the literary arts and motivating other writers, but I seem to be um, sort of split down the middle on that one. And I just love teaching writing. I just love it. I mean, and, you know, it's really not teaching. It's just blowing on pilot lights you know, and, and bringing the work to the surface that people are all set to go with. Excellent. And um, if somebody wanted to find your website, they can always go to the Sitka Center uh, website or Facebook page or Instagram page for those listening uh, for our most recent post with Ellen and her information for Fine. the Writing Ranch. Christy asks, which section of the High Desert Trail do you return to? You mentioned some favorite sections. Well, there's sort of a top 10. Um, I haven't, I have not gone, uh, and the Pueblo Mountains often figure in that according to other uh, trekkers, but, um, and they are just about sort of in Nevada. Uh, but for me, the Owyhee Canyonlands, I, I hope, I hope most of you were able to see those slides and uh, the Owyhee River running through those steep, it's, it's Oregon's own Grand Canyon. Mm. So, so th that is absolutely an extraordinary place, not to mention these huge gardens of petroglyphs um, that are very inaccessible otherwise, other than on the river or sort of hiking through. So that's one spot. The Badlands Outer Bend are 
kind of exquisite and they're just, as the book explains, the geologic kind of history you're trotting over is um, astounding. It's just astounding. Uh, and then as you could tell from the part that I read about approaching the playa, really any of those playas, they are, they are like an altered reality, whether it's Summer Lake or the Alhor Desert. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's just absolutely beautiful. The, the parts that don't get quite so many gold stars are, are those vast sections of sagebrush that really do like, look like a sagebrush ocean. And in fact, were part of the inland <coughs> sea. So, but I would, I would say Badlands, Summer Lake, UIE, and Heart Mountain. Those would be the top for me. The opening slideshow, those pictures were, were quite impressive. I can, I, I kind of had in my mind those pictures while I was listening to the reading and I think I need to go there now. Good. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully we have uh, some attendees thinking the same thing. Margot uh, <laughs> asks, do you think you'll continue to develop your focus on the high desert in a book to follow walking the high desert? Uh, she also says your presentation was fantastic. Yay. I paid her. <laughs> um, uh, such a, such, I hate it when um, news anchors ask each other questions and they say, oh, excellent question or something. But anyway, <laughs> that, that is an excellent question because I don't really know the answer. Um, uh, the desert has put its little hand in mind. I have to, in mine. I have to say that I'm inclined to write about it. But what's what I'm working on right now isn't so much in the desert. I mean, there's it's a push and pull right now. It really is. Mm. Uh, um. So maybe I guess. <laughs> very very unsatisfactory answer. It's a soft maybe. <laughs> Uh, Lori Ann has a question beyond the 10 essentials. And I'm, I'm maybe that's a backpack, uh, common, common mm -hmm. phrase, the 10 essentials backpacking, uh, what five essentials were you glad to have on your journey? Well, the Oregon desert trail, well, you, if you do it by shorter sections, you know, it's not quite as um, challenging, but if you take on say two, two you know, a longer distance, uh, be aware that this trail is not marked. There aren't little plaques there. There are, you have to cash your water over certain areas. Um, so it takes quite a bit of plotting and mapping. Now I think, uh, in addition to the sort of the essentials, um, I would say uh, if, if you can bring a, an extra battery pack or whatever to, to have some way of communicating with the world, whether it's for your cell phone or whatever, I think that would be important. Um, I think not to bring with you, but to read up on and be smart about uh, you know, as I mentioned, the sort of the pestilence of the desert. So there are ticks and Lyme disease and other kinds of tick-borne diseases are now in the high desert. So there are some precautions to take. Um, there are some things that are sort of anti-tick. Uh, and, um, and obviously you can find one along the trail, but a stick of some sort so that when you're going through deeper brush, you can make a lot of noise and wiggle the stick around just so that you give rattlesnakes advance warning. They don't, mm. they don't like to be surprised and they, they, but I, I, I frankly adore snakes and have great respect for rattlesnakes and I don't blame them when they're surprised. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the best answer to that question actually is if you go to the Oregon Natural Desert Association website, um, in addition to a full sort of map guidebook that you can get thanks to Renee Patrick, who is the keeper of the trail for ONDA, there are also links to um, 
various other hikers uh comments and blogs and mm. you know the from the from sage clegg a, a woman who was the first one to hike it through and at the time held the world's record for the fastest hiking of the three longest through hikes i mean i don't know how many miles she put on under her belt in the space of a year the the oregon desert trail by through hike standards is very short the average length is more like 2000 something miles and this is 750 mm, okay. but it's a it's challenging because it doesn't have you know the well it doesn't have the notoriety and therefore little support stations and whatnot say that the pacific crest trail has or something like that Lorian clarified um was there any personal essentials you brought oh. Um, that you especially enjoyed, not necessarily survival essentials. Uh huh. Well, I mean, a personal essential for me is a headlamp, so then you can read and or write in your journal in the dark. Um, and uh, a few other personal essentials would be getting the Star app. Mm. Or, I mean, and if you're a bird or a bird app or, you know, but, but there's so many, one, you can, you can carry, you know, an encyclopedia on your phone. Um, Instead of taking up space with guidebooks. Exactly. Nice. Bruce says, uh, first of all, thank you. And also that he was inspired to read your stories of the Oregon high desert. Mosquitoes almost uh, sucked him to death on a glorious evening in the Malheur National Wildlife <laughs> Refuge many days, many decades ago. Uh, but he says he survived and have missed the glory of that sunset ever since. Yeah. Oh, he's got it. See, he's got the bug, not just the mosquito, but <laughs> there's nothing mosquitoes like that. and otherwise. Yeah. Iretta says, I have never really appreciated the desert. I think maybe I've missed something. Enjoyed your reading very much, and I look forward to reading your book. Wow, well, that's great. And I really appreciate comments like that, given the fact that I went silent. Um, <laughs> yeah, it sort of, it was, it was a, a funny little moment. The, the internet was playing us. It was. Catherine says, I'll be buying copies of your book, one for us and more for nephews who live in Bend. Thank you for such a wonderful reading and your writing, which is from such a thoughtful perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I just think, you know, I think that after that Bundy occupation, my idea to do this little sort of thing about a trail and public lands and all of that, it just went kaboom. And mm -hmm. It is so obvious to me that if we look at the big issues that face us wherever we are, uh, the desert, strangely, and its communities can show us how to address them. Um, there are organizations, the High Desert Partnership, for example, out of Burns was operating even before the Bundy occupation, but because it was, and because it had representatives on it from government and you know, federal government and local government and ranchers and all the different perspectives. I don't care what the problem is, but it's a model. It's a great model for finding a way out of what looks impossible. So, mm -hmm. so I try to present problem after problem. Um, I mean, not quite that much drudgery, but, uh, and then in the end, kind of harvest the examples we might not have noticed along the way of ways to approach solution, which I think you heard that tone, I hope, in the yes. reading uh, about the symphony. Yes. Um, I don't see any more open questions. If anyone, uh, I see we still have some attendees. If anybody has a, another question, we could, we have a few more moments. Um, otherwise, uh, we could do our closing remarks. Jeannie Corlett uh, says, I read the Oregon desert as a teenager, looking forward to reading other perspectives and comparing that historical view with a more modern one. Thank you for the great reading. Thank you. 
Lorianne says, writing with a purpose is your gift. Thank you for writing. Sarah I'm gonna, says, I'm gonna move to Sitka. I'm gonna move to <laughs> Nesco <Nesquilin. laughs> um, You'll have a fan base. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we're out of time, right? Uh, if not, I could close with a quick poem. Please do that, Ellen. Shall I? I'll just grab it. The reason I bring it up is that I, I got, I was inspired while I was at Sitka. While she's grabbing the poem, I'll, I'll thank all of you for gathering uh, today. Uh, so appreciate having so many Sitka community members together in one place at one time. And, uh, and thanks so much, Ellen. Um, if I can't put my hands on it quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll give up on the idea. But if I can, I would just love to share it with you. Um, because it came to me. Here we are. <clears throat> The title of the poem, this is, this, this is sort of whiplash. This is not the desert. <laughs> the title is Happy Nails. Downbeat mall on outskirts of tourist town, salon air filled with fruity smell of acetone. Vietnamese in masks gesture white foot to basin, white fingers to bowl. On the wall, a metallic Buddha, a poster of bright purple horses galloping through gauzy clouds, a swivel-eyed cat clock with a tick-tocking black tail. Ow says hello, spreads a white terry towel, arranges bottled color tiny scissor file. I place my palms face down. He bows his head, studies my fingers one by one, plucking them like strings of a dantran, then flapjacks my whole hand this way and that, Two caramel children scamper through home from school, beaming, he shoes them away. Very good, very, very good, very good student, very smart, my sons. We spend part of our afternoon, part of our life like this, face to face, close to done. He applies scarlet red polish, my old hand supported in his young palm, mismatch in size, age, color, joined in circumstantial prayer, arrested applause. What arc of history of story brought us both here now? For some reason I don't know, I feel filled with hope. Raising the tiny red lacquer soaked brush in the air like a conductor, he asks for my other hand. So there. Thank you uh, for that, Ellen. Thank you for an inspiring reading and uh, a wonderful closing poem. Thanks everyone for gathering today from all of us at Sitka. We wish you a good evening and a beautiful sunset and in Ellen's words, Earth's bold collision with sky. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody. <laughs>